very much. So I want to begin by covering a few topics that I glazed over a bit in the Gee series, and that will lead us into doing some product design sketches. We'll begin once again with a basic form and perspective that will round out the corners of. If you've ever used a 3D modeling program, you'll be familiar with the term edge loop, or a series of lines that wrap around a polygon. Well that's essentially what I'm creating here. Once I've created this axial edge loop, I create two sets of perpendicular edge loops. These will help me round out the edges in the coronal and sagittal planes. I create a vertical line wherever the two perpendicular edge loops intersect. This is a much more thorough and precise way to round out edges, as opposed to the way I did it in the Becoming a Geese series, which was more focused on using the fewest amount of guidelines as possible. While I don't always draw this way, doing so can help build up your understanding of forms, and it has many practical uses in industrial design sketching. So today our emphasis will be on accuracy and using as many guidelines as necessary. Now that I have all the edge loops in place to round off the top edges, I place in a curve in purple for each individual axis. And now in green I'm going to round off the axial corners. Now I'm rounding off the top face. And now I'm going to extend those edge loops down to the ground plane. Once again in green, I'm going to round out the axial edges. And now in black, I'm going to sketch out the silhouette of the form we've created. I add a heavier line weight underneath to emphasize that that bottom plane is in shadow. And speaking of shadows, now I add in some value to emphasize the form. And since our edges are rounded, we need to make sure that all of our value transitions are gradients. The next thing we're going to do is cut away a circular form from a rectangular one. This situation will arise anytime you have a circular element in whatever you're drawing. But as with most scenarios, it's much easier to place a rectangular form in perspective than it is a circular one. Now that we have our block out in place, I create another two sets of perpendicular edge loops, only this time they're abbreviated to one face. The reason being is that I only want to create a smaller square on the back face. If you recall back to perspective part one, you'll remember that you can create two lines from corner to corner to find the center of any plane. Now that this framework is in place, I create an ellipse for the front and back faces, with the back ellipse fitting into the smaller square. Ellipses can be really tricky, so make sure you're comfortable with them before doing this. Now I'm connecting the center point of each edge on the front face to the center point of each edge on the back face. Much like in the first example, this will help me create a curved cross-section that connects the two ellipses. Another detail that I felt needed to be covered a little bit further is creating slanted planes. Once we have our primitive blackout in place, we can create our angled plane by connecting the front edges to the top edges via diagonal lines. In order to ensure that we create the same diagonal across the plane, we travel towards the right vanishing point from each vertex until we intersect the far edges. Now with our angled plane in place, I'm just showing how we can round out each edge. We can also cut into or build off of a form by manipulating the center line. Shown here in blue is the center line for the form that I've created. Notice here that I'm cutting back towards the left vanishing point into the form.
I connect the inner rectangle to the outer one, much in the same way as I did with the ellipse demonstration. As I'll demonstrate here, you can also build out from your center line. The technique is virtually identical, except now in this case, we're heading away from the left vanishing point. Alright, enough digital stuff, let's try this out on pen and paper. I'm sure you're tired of hearing it by now, but we're going to start with a rectangular prism once again. While doing this kind of sketching, I typically work in a very light line weight until I have my framework in place. Because I want the front face to slope inwards, I create a diagonal traveling away from the front edges. By having a line spanning across the back face, I can create two points that are at the same elevation. The same goes for the front face. I'm rounding out the edges just as I did in the beginning of the video, except now I'm using fewer guidelines. Be cognizant of the fact that you can round out edges in one axis and not the other. In this instance, we're leaving the front face flat. And now I'm building out a small square form. And here I'm adding in small design details and cut lines. Now I'm going to use a somewhat different approach. Instead of starting with a primitive block out, I start with a center line and ground plane, much in the same vein as Scott Robertson's videos. Here I'm drawing in an ellipse to correspond to the wheel of the vacuum. And now I create an axial cross section to establish the width. This front ellipse is a design detail, and just like in the second part of the video, I can use an ellipse to cut back into that form. As shown by the center line, that front face slopes back, so I'm duplicating that to the right. Now I'm creating the handle at the top, cutting in to establish the width. I need only duplicate that line back towards the left vanishing point to create width. another rounded rectangular prism. And now the trapezoidal wedge emerging from the base of the vacuum. Again, notice how I use wrapping lines and center lines to help demonstrate the form. And I'm relying heavily on the curved duplication techniques demonstrated in part two of this series. Notice that cutting in with the center line demonstrates that it's indented. And now I'm adding in some hatching to show the cast shadow. If you enjoyed the video, please like and subscribe. I'll be putting out new videos every Thursday, as well as live streaming every Friday through Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you want to catch up with all the previous live streams, get group lessons, or just want to support the channel, you can sign up at patreon.com. Stick around till next week for another new episode. Thank you guys.